All right, everybody, welcome tonight. Uh, one of the objectives that you're going to need to conquer if you want to pass the CompTIA a certification exam is objective 1.11 on the 1102 side, which is all about Linux commands. Now, uh, I'm going to teach them tonight in the order that they show up in the objectives. It's not necessarily how I would teach them, but just so you could uh, follow along more easily, we're going to go that route. Uh, for tonight's demonstration for this lab, if you want to replicate this yourself at home, uh, all you need is Windows PowerShell, and then you need to install the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, in order to use WSL, you need to have Windows 10 build 19041 or higher. If you have Windows 11, you're set. Anything below that cannot run WSL currently. Uh, in particular, I'm using the Kali Linux distribution. Uh, for this, for WSL, it doesn't really matter, especially if we're just practicing command line. Um, if we're just, you know, working on our commands in the command line interface, it doesn't really matter which distribution, but I'm very familiar with Kali Linux. It's Debian uh, based distro. Uh, one thing to take note of, though, when you install WSL and you install any of these specific uh, distributions within WSL, it's always going to default to installing a minimal installation. And so you may need to go in and install what's called the full meta packages, which I actually had to do in order to unlock some command line options for the Kali Linux distribution. And then finally, I'm going to be using uh, the fish shell in Linux just to give a little bit easier syntax highlighting, basically so we can see the file locations and some of the output a little bit better. Uh, it stands for friendly interactive shell, and it's one of the main things I install whenever I want to uh, utilize Linux, uh, and here it's going to come up right here, and you'll see the difference. It makes it nice and bright and does a great job of highlighting everything. And then if you, again, want to run this after you get WSL installed, all you have to do is use that command right there, wsl.exe, tac d, cali-linux. And here we go. Number one, ls, list directory contents. Uh, this is very similar to dir in Microsoft Windows operating systems. And some of the common switches or options you may see are the tac l, which is going to give us a long listing format, basically give us a bunch more information about the files and folders that are within that directory. And you'll notice it has, uh, you know, some of the uh, ownership is in there and permissions and the, the size of the file and when it was created. We can also, if there were hidden files, show hidden files by using the A option. And um, we can finally, we can combine multiple of them together, for instance, using the long listing and to uh, uh, sort it by size. And so we can do the TAC S, and that is LS. PWD, print the working current working directory. Sometimes you get lost. Sometimes you're working in a Linux distribution that doesn't have the actual working path listed in the, line, in the command line itself. Um, sometimes you might be working within a shell and forget where you are. So PWD is very useful. It's kind of plain. It pretty much always assumes uh, the physical path on everything, but that's how you use it, PWD. Next, we have is MV, which moves or renames files and directories. Uh, some of the common switches you're going to encounter definitely on the exam is the TAC I to prompt before overriding existing files. So if you have something that pre-exists there uh, and you don't want to force it to, or you want to be prompted to whether or not to override or not, you can invoke that option. You can force it to overwrite. Uh, you can tell it do not write any existing files. So if there's something that's pre-existing that is the same uh, file name and extension, it won't overwrite it. And you can also uh, invoke the V option to get verbose output, which means, you know, show me a little bit more. Don't just hide all the information. I want to see all the inner workings that's going on as you run these commands or interact with these files. Next up, we have CP, which copies files and directories. And uh, some of the ones you can definitely encounter on the exam are, again, prompt before overriding existing files, force overriding our existing files, do not override existing files, and then copy directives, uh, directories recursively, which means go all the way down the line. Um, those are definitely, one or, one or more of those may definitely be on the exam. Next up we have RM, which is going to remove files and directories, so the exact opposite of CP. And again, with these, you can prompt before deleting each file, or you can force deletion without prompting, or you can delete all directories recursively with the R option as well. And here you can see me removing 1.txt. And then setting it to prompt me, do I really want to do it? No. And then we can ls and still see that it, the 1.txt is still there. 
Chmod. So here we're going to get into changing permissions of files and directories. This one's uh, slightly different than most other options. You'll see up here, what I'm doing is actually listing the files and I want to change the ownership of the user to rewrite and then the group and other users to just read, which is the geo equals R on the two dot docx file. We can also, with Chmod, do things such as um, make something executable. So here we have your common Hello World script that I created real quick in Nano, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit. And in order to actually run that, we actually have to give the permission to execute or make it executable for that script. And that's what I'm doing here with Chmod A plus X. And now if we actually run the Hello World script, we list it, we can see there's Hello World, there's the permissions on it. Everybody has execute and we can run the script and print out our little hello world message. Chown is where we actually get into changing ownership of files and directories. Um, the doesn't, we don't get into too many of the in-depth options with the A, A plus exam for this particular command, but you should know how to uh, recursively change directories in their contents. When you're changing ownership of one thing, you may want to change all child items located within it as well. And then also, you also want to be able to know how to specify a new user and group uh, for a particular file or folder. And su or sudo, which is our switch user or execute commands with a super user privilege. Depending on who you talk to in the industry, su and sudo either means switch user and switch user do or super user and super user do. I'm not sure which one is right. Some of the old hats will say one thing, some of the new hats say other things, but uh, you're gonna frequently need to elevate your privileges to do certain system level processes or, or interact with certain file locations, things like that. And here you can see what I did was, um, I don't know if you caught that, but I added a, you, I did the user add and added a test user too. Uh, of course, I forgot to invoke sudo, right? Which you can't just add users without being those elevated privileges. So it kicked it back and said, uh, nope, nope, you gotta go ahead and invoke it with sudo, which is what I do here in a second. Denied, because again, I didn't do it with sudo. And now it's gonna add that test user too, and I can verify that it's going to, or that it added it by catting out, which we're gonna get into concatenate here in a minute too, my Etsy password file. And I can actually see there's my test user too that it just added to the group. Apt get. So there's quite a few package management utilities depending on which list, uh, Linux distribution. Luckily, we only need to know two, uh, apt, uh, apt advanced package tool and the yum package manager for Red Hat Linux. Um, but apt is really cool. But here you can see what I did was an apt get update to actually update the uh, all the source files. In Linux uses this thing called rolling repos to kind of be able to ensure that there's stability and people are always able to access the latest uh, you know, verified files and updates and everything. So what I did here was I invoked, I forgot sudo at first. So then I went ahead and sudo because this is system level and I had it update from the repos and now I'm having it go ahead and pull and install all those things that it found are updatable within my distribution right here by invoking the upgrade command. And this will take a minute or two. I actually left this in. If you look, this is a YouTube video because it got too big for a GIF to include in this. But I thought it was cool to uh, to include in because not many people have seen how quickly Linux can update all these packages in the back end. And keep in mind, this is not just software stuff. This is also underlying um, processes and, and services that are needed to run the actual operating system itself. And then, of course, all the dependencies that anything might need. Um, so it does a lot right here. And if we give it just another few more seconds, it'll finish up. And here it goes. And we can watch it setting up everything now that it's downloaded and installed it. It's doing all the configuration, uh, all the triggers so that one thing processes another. And cool, so we've done that. Another thing you can do with apt is actually at in install specific stuff. So if you remember a few weeks ago, we had the CTF uh, AMA. One of the applications or one of the CTFs was uh, CalSay CTF. So here I wanted to install CalSay with apt and then test it to make sure it works and yeah, Cow say works. Cow say hello, and the cow says hello for me. So let's go ahead and remove that cow say. Verify that yes, we want to remove it, and let's go ahead and make sure it actually is removed by trying to invoke it, and we'll see command not found. So very cool. We can do a lot of stuff. 
Here is the Yum package management utility. Uh, unfortunately, I was a little bit lazy in this and I didn't get a chance to completely set up a Red Hat Linux distro to show you it, but a lot of the commands, a lot of the options are very similar in nature to the apt uh, yeah, to the APT uh, tool. And uh, so they're listed down here, install, remove, update, check, update. And as you can see, the status screen for it is very similar as well. It goes out to the mirrors or the, or the you know, rolling repos. It grabs the latest and greatest. It checks if there's any dependencies that need to be installed before installing it. It installs a specific version. It tests it, verifies it, and then boom, all done. So yum, very similar. A lot of the options are very similar as well. IP. So now we're getting into our connectivity stuff, right? How do we actually display some of our network information here? And IP is one of the first things that you need to know for the Linux side of the CompTIA Plus exam. And if we invoke the IP ADDR commands or IP address, we can see some basic information about the one interface that I have here virtually. Um, and the actual ethernet uh, interface here with my IP. We can also get a route so we can see what specifically uh, interface my data is going out on. And we can also see the link status indicator of the physical nature of the port. Is that port physically up? You know, what are all its settings? So cool stuff with IP. DF we can use to display disk space usage. And uh, Word, uh, you know, it, it's not easily readable by humans, just so you know. What I did here was I went ahead and listed all the file systems on here. Now, keep in mind, this is WSL, so it is technically a virtualized file system. So it's going to look different. There's going to be a lot of mount points and a lot of temp stuff, temp file systems and all that. But if we uh, uh, invoke the uh, T option here, we can see all the different file systems like ext4, which you should be familiar with, and then a bunch that you probably haven't heard because they're all temporary stuff. And we can also make it more human readable. So we can actually see the overall sizes and, and it makes it a little bit easier for us humans, non-machines to digest. So very cool stuff with the DF command. GREP, GREP actually stands for Global Regular Expression Print. And that probably isn't on the exam, but grep is a huge tool in Linux for searching for patterns in a file or outputs, logs, things like that. Uh, here, what I did was I actually grepped for the word world in this one.txt file. And you'll see it has a bunch of lines that say word world, word world. I don't know why I did that, just to make it slightly more confusing, I guess. But we can also go out with grep and I can have it show line numbers too. So if there were a bunch... If it was a 6,000 line, you know, document or log or something, and it only found a few instances of that word or that phrase that you were searching for, having the line numbers, you know, so you can know directly where to go to in that document is huge, right? So grep is a, a massive, massive uh, time saver. We also have PS which is gonna display our running processes here on our system. You'll notice that by default, PS only notices that I'm running bash, fish, and the PS command, which are basically all user uh, runs uh, processes. But if I go ahead and show all processes, I can see some of the underlying stuff that is running the Kali Linux WSL distro. And if I in uh, invoke TAC A, I can see just the ones that I'm using right now, which are fish and PS. And then I can also show the full process information and the long full process information if you want to get into user IDs and things like that. One of the most useful tools that you're going to have is access to MAN. MAN stands for manual. Every single command has a manual page. Like you'll notice I just did MAN IP and it brings me right into the manual page of it. Shows me how to format my command, how to use it. Gives me a bunch of examples of options and where they fit in my syntax. And then as I scroll down, it also shows me, hey, look, this is what it means. Not, not only are here the options you can do, but this is you know a couple sentences on what it means, what you're gonna actually be doing when you invoke these options. Really, really useful stuff. So man, every command has one. But maybe we're searching for the keyword IP. And we want to find all pages that have that. If we invoke that with the K option, it's going to pull up everything. Unfortunately, it also grabs zip stuff here, right? I should have invoked a more strict search. But uh, it's going to grab everything that's a manual that has that word in it, which can be very useful if you're searching for usage of things across multiple, um, you know, multiple uh, commands. And we can also find the location of our manual page for a specific command by using uh, TAC W. And we can actually see that, hey, this is where it's stored on the system. So possibly we might have outdated manual pages and we might need to update the database cache for the man page. Um, and you know, that's one of the ways that you can tell. 
Top is going to display our system resource usage and processes utilizing these resources. So everything that's actually running, uh, and keep in mind, it's running on WSL, so it's not going to recognize all those Windows processes. But here you can see all this stuff running as root that enables the underlying framework. And then we can also see the stuff invoked by the Kali user, which is my bash, my fish shell, and the uh, current top process. We can also show processes for specific process IDs. So if I want to look at process ID 22 over here, which is running fish, I can just single that one out and I can see very specific information on that, how long it's been running at the time, you know, CPU and memory usage, all that good stuff. And we can also show all individual threads if we wanted to thread it out instead of do it based on processes themselves. Find is very good. Find for finding locations and uh, for finding files and directories, showing the locations of them. You can do uh, finds by name or type. You can also do things like a wildcard search. Like here I did find asterisk.txt, so it's going to show me all txt files in there. You can do the same with the docx files. So find is very useful as well. Remember, only files and directories for find. Dig. Dig, highly useful tool. If you are looking at a website online, trying to find out some of the underlying information here, if I dig totalsem.com, I can get some information on the server that's hosting it, the IP, the last time it was updated, all sorts of things like that. Maybe I just want the IP. So I can invoke dig plus short totalsem.com and it just gives me the IP that totalsem operates under. I can also give all, or get all DNS records for that specific domain that I'm querying, in this case totalsem. And I can also trace my route, like from uh, the DNS lookup process for me for totalsem so I can find out exactly what servers I'm getting the records from and all sorts of good stuff about it. And here you can see where we're getting our name server responses back and some of our certificate information and some of them failed. But lots of information on DIG on, for a domain using DIG. Cat or concatenate. Uh, displays and concatenates the contents of a file. This is really good if you don't want to open up a file. For instance, I can do cat tac n to show number of lines in the output and go back to that one file that we had before. And here we go. We can see all the... the printed output, you know, the, the screen printed output of that 1.txt, as well as all the numbers on it as well. And we can do things like combine other commands, like if it was a long jumble of text, I can issue the eek option to actually put a dollar sign at the end of each line, so I know where everything officially ends. Very useful tool. And finally, we have nano. Nano is a command line text editor. There are many of them out there. You'll, you get to choose which ones you want, uh, which one you want to use, VI, uh, Vim, Nano, all sorts of them. So I personally prefer Nano. Nano is real easy to use. Here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a file called file.txt by just invoking it in Nano. You can see it automatically pulls it up. I'm working within that file here. So I'm going to go ahead and type a little something. Thank you for the memories. And you'll notice uh, Nano has a bunch of options down here. They're all invoked with Control and then that letter. So if I hit Control X to exit out, watch this, it's going to say Save Modified Buffer. That's asking me, hey, do I want to save my changes to file.txt? Well, yes, I do. So let me go ahead and hit Y. And then it's going to say File Name to Write to, File.txt, which matches. It's going to keep it the same. And I just hit Enter. And now you can see that if I go in, there's my File.txt is in there now. And if we cat that out, we can see that file.txt has our message in it that we just put in in Nano. And so those are essentially the 20 commands that you need to know to pass the Linux side, which is objective 1.11 on the 1102 CompTIA A plus certification exam. And if you like this type of training, if you want to see more of it, feel free to scan that QR code down below. It's going to take you to my Udemy page where you can pick up the exam core one and the exam core two training that I did with Mike Myers. It is a fantastic piece of training material. And I thank you all for being here tonight.